Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program will begin shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome and enjoy this short message from keynote sponsor, Groby Optimization. I'm Ed Rothberg. I'm CEO and one of the co-founders at Groby Optimization. There's a very powerful technology. Uh, it's got a very strong mathematical foundation. So the roots of mixed integer programming go back to the 1940s. Technology's been refined and improved over the last 50 plus years and technology is now to a point where it can robustly solve just a huge variety of problems for many different industries. MIP has literally transformed many industries including supply chain planning, electrical power generation and distribution, uh, computational finance, uh, sports scheduling. The list of industries that have been affected by MIP is just incredibly long. One unique property of mixed integer programming is its combination of expressiveness and robustness. Um, what this allows you to do, it allows you to state a problem, obtain high quality, reliable solutions to that problem, and then later you can make a change to the problem as your business needs change. And MIP will continue to produce high quality, reliable solutions. Um, this is actually quite different from most technologies where if you make a change to the problem you're solving, you very often need to totally rethink your approach to solving that problem. So the breadth of applications of mixed integer programming, is, it's quite enormous. So at one point we actually did a tally of all the different industries that our customers are in, and we got to nearly 40 different industries. We're seeing more and more companies building applications that use both machine learning and optimization. So for example, they'll use machine learning to make predictions about what's likely to happen in the future. And then they'll use MIP to make recommendations about what actions to take in order to take advantage of these likely future outcomes. Good morning, KDD. That was not loud enough. Good morning, KDD. We are getting there once more. Good morning, KDD. Getting there. Great. My name is Ankur Tere Desai, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Kensai and the General Co-Chair with Vipin Kumar uh, of the 25th anniversary of KDD. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, and welcome here uh, Peter Lee from Microsoft. Uh, I have worked in healthcare AI for the last decade, and I'm terribly excited to have someone who's a true champion of this movement, uh, representing all of us in this journey towards making uh, the patient lives through data better. Peter Lee is a corporate vice president at Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft has made significant investments in healthcare recently, and who better but Peter to spearhead those efforts in making sure that we are driving in the right direction. Peter has a very illustrious career. He's been the head of uh, computer science department at CMU. He's led many initiatives in DARPA uh, before joining Microsoft. And he's been in advising role for shaping government policy around interoperability, which is amazing. At KDD, we often do not get to hear the views from the trenches, and it is amazing that today we will hear not only what has happened in the past, but also how this is going to shape the future of a very important vertical in the computing industry, healthcare. With that, it's a great honor and a pleasure, and with humility and pride at the same time, I, l I would love to present to you Peter Lee. Peter, please join us. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank Welcome, you. Peter.
Wow, that was really a, a great introduction. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's really great to be here. And KDD uh, has always been and continues to be such an important conference. And so it's really an honor also to be here. I, uh, you know, I, I am a little sheepish about that introduction because I'm fairly new to healthcare. Um, but I'm surrounded in my work, not only within Microsoft, but with a, a lot of colleagues and collaborators at a lot of great institutions, with a lot of people who have really kind of devoted uh, their careers and much of their lives to improving healthcare, improving our health and wellness overall, improving the outcomes uh, when we need treatment, uh, introducing and creating more efficiencies, uh, and just making the whole experience more satisfying. And so what I wanted to do today is uh, give a little bit of the, my own personal learnings on this journey uh, into healthcare. And so I thought I would start with this slide, if we have slides, and, and talk about uh, an example that really excites me a lot because it has a perfect combination of really cutting edge biology and biotechnology with the latest ideas in machine learning and computer science. And this has to do with the adaptive immune system, with the human immune system specifically. So when a doctor takes a sample of your blood, she ends up holding in her hand on the order of a million of your T cells. Each of those T cells is genetically programmed to seek out, neutralize some pathogenic threat. That specificity is actually determined by an extracellular receptor on the surface of the T cell, which is normally referred to as the T cell receptor. And one of the exciting advances in our understanding of the biology of the adaptive immune system uh, is that we have isolated the genes that code for or control that specificity of each T cell receptor. And so not surprisingly, this has created an explosion of research interest in understanding what is commonly referred to as the T cell receptor repertoire or TCR repertoire. The set of T cell receptors that are floating around in your body and what that might say about the condition uh, of your health. Uh, in fact, for us, we've been engaged in that research because there is an interesting machine learning problem. And, um, and so here uh, is a, a plot where we've taken samples of 503 TCR repertoires uh, and done a training in order to try to separate out those repertoires that are indicative of the presence of cytomegalovirus from the person whose uh, blood was drawn versus not. And then we tested on 127 repertoires. And as you can see from here, if we have the label data, we can actually get very, very strong results. Now, of course, this is an idea that is being studied around the world in many different research institutions. Uh, and if we actually had enough uh, label data, uh, we could actually start to imagine doing this at scale for many different types of diseases, many different kinds of cancers, infectious diseases, and autoimmune disorders. The the problem, of course, is how to get that data. And so another very interesting uh, thing that has happened is that we uh, have the possibility of learning from antigen-specific T cell receptors. And so in a project at Microsoft in collaboration with Adaptive Biotechnologies uh, and a number of top research institutions and universities, we've been engaged collaboratively to use an assay called MIRA so that in vitro we can use naive blood samples, naive T cell receptors, and test and observe the binding of those T cell receptors to relevant antigens. And we've been focused in this particular thing that I'm about to show you on uh, cytomegalovirus, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, and influenza. Those are very common because in this room, it's probably the case that pretty much every single person in this room uh, has been infected by one of these uh, viruses or uh, has been uh, immunized against one of them. 
And so by doing that, what we're able to do uh, is make those observations, uh, learn the antigen-specific models from those, uh, and then uh, from that start to make inferences uh, about, uh, uh, about the uh, broader uh, predictions for whole T cell receptor repertoires. And with that, we're able to get over the hump of the barrier of having labeled training samples. And in fact, without training on any repertoires, uh, we can get very strong and very precise results. And furthermore, uh, we can even then boost those results uh, on, on additional naive samples. And so now what we have is the opportunity ahead of us to really get very precise diagnostic capabilities uh, really trained on the T cell receptors and the TCR repertoires that we get uh, just from ordinary people. We don't have to look for specific people with specific diseases. And so this unreasonable effectiveness of data is just something that has become very important in a wide range of areas. And in this particular project, which on the Microsoft side is led by Jonathan Carlson, uh, and on the adaptive biotechnology side is led by Harlan Robbins and Ryan Emerson, we are seeking to build a pipeline where from a simple one mil blood sample, we can use proprietary immuno sequencing technologies at adaptive, subject those to a machine learning pipeline that's been trained to understand or decode the signals in those TCR repertoires, in those samples of your TCR repertoire, and on uh, that basis gain the possibility of something approaching in time a universal blood-based diagnostic. And so that blood-based diagnostic is something that, of course, is something very much in the, our future. Uh, but already uh, in our laboratory, uh, work, we've been getting very strong signals, very promising signals for a range of infectious diseases, such as Lyme disease, as well as autoimmune disorders like celiac disease, uh, and early signals for cancers, such as pancreatic cancer and ovarian cancer. And so, one by one, we hope that by gathering more and more uh, uh, data from, uh, from people, we're able to train these systems in order to achieve what in time would be a universal blood-based diagnostic. And so this is something that, for me, as a non-biologist, as someone who is not an expert in biotechnology or bioengineering, but speaking as a computer scientist, just strikes me as an incredible possibility for the future. And in fact, is something that is, to my mind, uh, something approaching science fiction. I'm trying to uh, advance these slides, uh, if we can get some technical help for that. There. And in fact, um, you know, at Microsoft Research, uh, uh, some of you might be aware, uh, Microsoft Research was founded uh, by Rick Rashid. Uh, Rick, amongst other things, besides being a great systems researcher, uh, is uh, also a very well-known Trekkie, Star Trek fan. Uh, and when you think about universal diagnostic, you can't help but uh, dream about ideas like the tricorder becoming real, truly universal diagnostic. All right, so it's just blindingly obvious, and I'm sure that many of you in this room have your own examples of how data, given the tools that we have now, how data can be turned into transformational possibilities and impact in healthcare and life sciences. And that is just one example that's top of mind for me, but there are many others, and I'll go through a few others as well. Uh, but before I do that, I, I just wanted to pause a little bit and explain a little bit about what is going on at Microsoft in this area, because of course our own CEO, Satya Nadella, uh, has his examples and his own inspiration and his own personal reasons as well. And so while we are working within the confines uh, and within the context of Microsoft research, about three years ago, Satya Nadella made a fairly interesting move 
uh, one that actually confused me for some time, which was to shift much of the strategy setting, including the business strategy for Microsoft in healthcare uh, into our research organization. And so while we're still doing fundamental research, we're still publishing openly and we're still inventing. And within the administrative structure and financial structure of a big corporation like Microsoft, while we still have no financial accountability, we're still a, an organization uh, that like most research organizations doesn't make money, we just spend money. Uh, we suddenly have been finding ourselves in charge of the future direction of Microsoft's business within healthcare. And internally, we sort of joked that this was equivalent to our CEO throwing us into the middle of the Pacific Ocean and asking us to find land. In the vastness of the possibilities in healthcare and life sciences, you just don't know which direction to swim. You don't know what to do. And it was very confusing for us also. And so which way do you swim? Uh, you, after a little bit of swimming, you start to feel better about yourself because you start to see many other people out there swimming equally lost. Uh, in fact, you, you, you even take some uh, shameful uh, glee in seeing, seeing some uh, drowning going on around you. Um, but fundamentally, it's an uneasy thing to understand what it is that we should be doing. And so one of the things that we were coached to think about from our CEO is to ask the question, if Microsoft, and let me just extend that, if the computer science research community were to disappear today, in what ways would the world of healthcare tomorrow and into the future be harmed or held back? And that question was very important to us, as uncomfortable as it was, it was very important as a way to get us focused on what is it that we should be doing? What is the value that we, as computer science researchers, could and should be bringing to healthcare? What is the right for us to be and play in this space? And when you go through that process, you start to think about a lot of things. And a lot of it ends up coming down to uh, the importance of data. And Ultimately, the main message I want to convey here today is that it's very important for all of us as a computer science research community to become expert and engaged in the, what is today a very rapidly evolving world of data in healthcare. And so I'll say a little bit more about that uh, as we go along. All right, and so let me go through a few other examples, uh, though, um, uh, before I get into uh, specific technical issues around health data. Uh, another example is, um, uh, has to do with language processing in healthcare. Now, one of the cool things about that TCR repertoire analytics problem is it is something that's very similar or, uh, to uh, machine translation problem. In fact, some of the machine learning that we're using is similar in many respects to neural machine translation. In essence, we are trying to translate the language of T cell receptor repertoires into the language of antigens. Uh, and then, of course, those types of language technologies, NLP, speech processing, machine translation, uh, have their direct applications. Uh, and so one of the uh, of applications has to do with addressing the burden of clinical documentation. And so if we can get to the next slide. One thing that's happening today is there's been a rapid advancement in government regulations around the need to digitize health records, your medical and health records. And that includes, for example, the clinical encounter notes. So when you go see your doctor, there's an encounter note that has to be recorded in digital form. And so many of you uh, probably have had the same experience that I have every time I see my doctor. Uh, in fact, I just had my annual uh, checkup just a couple of weeks ago. And while I love my doctor, she basically didn't make eye contact with me. She was sitting at a desk in the examination room uh, at her laptop uh, asking me questions and, and typing in uh, some notes as she went along. 
And the reason for that is uh, there are now regulatory requirements around this. And in fact, to get paid uh, for that encounter, uh, the doctor needs to do this. And roughly speaking, through several studies, 40 to 45 percent of a doctor's, uh, a primary care physician's time now is spent working on that documentation. And this has been leading to a significant level of burnout. Uh, and if uh, you want to read a somewhat sen sensationalistic but lurid and uh, fairly comprehensive account of that burden, um, For or Fortune magazine uh, last year had a whole issue dedicated to this uh, on the epidemic of, of burnout. And so we asked the question, is it possible to use language processing to streamline and smooth out this process of clinical documentation and enable doctors, again, to make eye contact with, uh, their, uh, with their patients? And so this is a project that we've been working on at Microsoft called EmpowerMD uh, with a number of partners. And I'd like to show you a short demo video uh, uh, showing the current state of where we're at. Here's doctor-patient conversations and creates medical intelligence to generate a medical note. I'm just going to ask you a, a series of questions to make sure we're not missing. While the doctor focuses on the patient, the system captures the dialogue. Really tired lately or anything like that? I'm just a little tired. Okay. From okay. okay. Um, how about any problems with, well, have you noticed a fever or just generally feeling unwell? No. Okay. You mentioned the headaches. Just the headache. Um, Integrating this dialogue with context from the patient's health record, a learning system in the cloud generates a medical note. After the visit, the doctor can easily edit the note generated by the system. Let's see how this technology works. The intelligent scribe extracts clinical content from the dialogue and classifies it to standard sections of the medical note. It also identifies clinically relevant concepts. The clinical content is synthesized to generate note suggestions. The doctor can refer to the original transcript for more context on the suggestion. The system flags suggestions that need the doctor's attention. As she corrects the suggestions, the system learns her choices. The doctor is always in full control of the note and can modify it. She can capture the patient's speech. She can convert conversational speech to medical terms. And she can personalize the content of the note. Here's an example of how the review of systems could be presented. The intelligent scribe captures all changes and learns from them. This simplifies note creation. Over time, the doctor makes fewer edits to the medical note. Finally, the doctor can view important events in the patient's journey. This helps her with context for future visits. The intelligent scribe empowers doctors to focus more of their time on patients. This is a foundation for building a learning system that synthesizes medical knowledge at scale. So when we show this uh, to, to doctors and um, in our limited pilots, it literally brings tears uh, to some, uh, some doctors' eyes um, because this is just, has been such, uh, such a burden. At the same time, it, as I'll explain later, it has been so important that as a country, and in fact around the world, we've been successful in digitizing our, our health records. It gives us a foundation to work from. Uh, but unfortunately, we haven't put as much time in streamlining the process and reducing the burden of creating that digital, uh, that digital data. Uh, things like this also represent the coming together of a computer science and information technology industry with the regulatory requirements around healthcare. Uh, most of you have probably heard of HIPAA, which is a very strong privacy uh, rights law around health data. Uh, and there are other certifications uh, for privacy and security, such as high trust certification, which are required in many of these uh, systems. And so the underlying support for speech processing, for sentiment analysis, for natural language processing, and so on, all of those tools for machine learning, all of those tools end up having to meet those regulatory requirements. And so the other thing about this EmpowerMD project, which is led uh, at Microsoft by Ranjani Ramamurthy, uh, is how to evolve all of our services to meet those regulatory requirements. And there's been a tremendous advance in that, not just at Microsoft, but at many other tech companies. And so uh, another big 
thing that makes me very excited and optimistic for the future is the fact that as a computer science community, we are starting to get a clue uh, about uh, meeting these regulatory requirements. Uh, while we're on the subject of language processing, uh, here's another example. Um, today, uh, there is a, an, just an explosion. Sometimes, uh, as computer scientists, we have a hard time wrapping our heads around just how big the world of health and life sciences is. But for every minute that I'm speaking here to you today, there are two new papers, research papers, being posted on PubMed. Now, that's something like 4,000 papers per day. A large fraction of those pertinent to clinical oncology. And so a question is, you know, how can we possibly uh, keep up with this? And if you go to a cancer treatment center and there is a molecular tumor board of experts that is supposed to pass judgment on whether a specific proposed cancer treatment should be applied or not, how are they supposed to benefit from this deluge of, of research publication? We've been working on a machine reading project to ingest all these papers. Uh, and this is a project uh, called Hanover, which is run by uh, Hoi Fung Poon. Uh, and in Hanover, uh, we've ingested on the order of 30 million PubMed abstracts and about 1.5 million whole papers. Uh, and in this nightly ingest, uh, we apply machine reading in order to understand, for example, uh, in this abstract, uh, that there is, in the case of an EGFR gene uh, with the L858E mutation, that the drug gefitinib uh, is seen or observed to be effective. And so Hanover attempts to create a knowledge graph of information of those sorts of associations uh, in order to support a decision support tool uh, that enables uh, a tumor board of experts uh, to benefit from the very latest research knowledge. And in fact, we've been piloting this decision support tool uh, at a major uh, uh, NCI designated uh, cancer center. And we'll be saying more about that publicly in the near future. Uh, but the need here to use data and synthesize it into knowledge for people uh, is pretty extreme. Machine reading, as m most of you know, is of course uh, still a very challenging problem for us and in fact is quite difficult uh, still. Uh, but we've found that we can make actually very good progress uh, by focusing very specifically uh, on the narrow uh, area of, of uh, cancer. There are significant challenges. For example, there's a long tail of variations. In fact, if you want to just go through the research literature and look for the ways in which the concept of, the, of TP53 negatively regulating uh, BCL2, uh, what you find is just hundreds, sometimes thousands of different ways that that's expressed. Uh, and the number of, of instances of, of unique ways to express that concept uh, can be uh, shockingly small. It's a long tail. And then there is also tremendous ambiguity uh, as you go through that research literature. And so, for example, on the flip side, uh, something like PDF uh, can refer to a document format, uh, can refer to peptide uh, deformalized, um, or I suppose for a crowd like this, uh, it could be a, a probabilistic density function. Um, but the point here is that it takes a tremendous amount of analysis uh, and a tremendous amount of data in order to learn uh, how to read these documents and construct the correct and useful knowledge graph. And so with this, again, um, what is so exciting for our field is that we are steadily developing more and more interesting ways to overcome the labeling challenges that we used to suffer from. And so while it would be extremely difficult to come up with enough labeled data in order to train machine reading algorithms, even for narrowly for clinical oncology, today we're able to use semi-supervised learning techniques in order to take public domain knowledge 
as well as very large amounts of unlabeled data in order to train an algorithm and, and lead us to good results. So it's, again, very exciting. And again, illustrates the unreasonable effectiveness uh, of data uh, in attacking these problems. So another example, of course, uh, if I now could venture outside of the language domain, uh, is, is in computer vision. Um, and there's no shortage of great research going on at many, many universities and many companies, uh, including Microsoft, in applying computer vision, the latest advances computer vision techniques, to medical imaging problems. One problem that we've been very interested in, uh, in a project that uh, was founded by Antonio Criminisi, uh, and now uh, has uh, Aditya Nori and, uh, and others uh, driving, is a project we call Inner Eye, uh, where we're trying to relieve the burden of the kind of kind of pixel by pixel clicking that radiologists have to do in order to uh, segment tumors for the purposes of radiation therapy planning in cancer treatment. Uh, and so what we have found is that by using a uh, structure of layered decision force, we're able to get very good results. And in fact, good enough results that recently, last year, uh, we received uh, FDA approval, 510K approval as a software medical device uh, for the use of this type of imaging uh, tumor segmentation capability uh, for cancer treatment. Uh, and at a much simpler domain, uh, it's just interesting to just to see the kinds of innovative ideas that people have when they think of a computer vision. Um, you know, some of you might have elderly parents or friends that uh, have to take a lot of different pills. It can be confusing. Um, in fact, um, my own father sometimes uh, puts all of his pills uh, together and uh, you worry about forgetting which is which. Uh, or in the case of an overdose and someone's unconscious and you see pills lying around, you know, the emergency medical technicians sometimes want to know right away what are these things. Uh, and so in a recent paper uh, in one of the Nature blogs, uh, we showed it possible to use fairly simple contemporary computer vision uh, techniques in order to do very accurate uh, and rapid identification of pills. And then going beyond both language and vision uh, is the frontier of genomics. And there is so much possibility there, but it's still really waiting for research to lead to the advances that unlock the real health possibilities that are hidden in the human genome. Uh, and on that, one of the things we find very exciting is that around the world, there are more and more open research databases of whole human genomes that are supporting specific types of research. One that we've been involved with in partnership with DNA Nexus and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in an effort uh, led today at Microsoft by Chaz Bangor uh, is to build the St. Jude Cloud, which is the world's largest open pediatric cancer gene database, with now hundreds of institutions and researchers working in this realm. The purpose of this data is to really start to zero, zero in on the genetic information around some of the rarest cancers uh, that afflict the children that St. Jude's treats. These possibilities, I think, are just incredible. In fact, uh, there's a colleague of ours at Microsoft, John Cahan, uh, who has been working very hard on his own data-driven genomics search for a cure uh, for children. And so I'd like to show uh, this example uh, in our collaboration with Seattle Children's Hospital. Every year, over 3,500 infants die of SIDS-related causes in the U.S. alone. My son Aaron was one of them. Data scientists on the Microsoft Genomics team took publicly available CDC data of 26 million births and deaths and ran Microsoft AI on it. They discovered six correlations that showed statistical increases in SIDS. And then we went to Seattle Children's with their world-class medical researchers. We identify genetic contributions to pediatric disorders. 
John's data told us there are clues that are definitely worth pursuing. You have to bring everything together on the molecular level, genetic level, and big data level that gave us hope. We've been working together to create a genomic database that will identify many new genetic risk factors and new genes and pathways that can underlie SIDS. Through his DNA, my son Aaron is the first child in this database. So that work uh, is just something that, again, is important not only specifically for SIDS, not only specifically for parents like John uh, that uh, have suffered the tragic consequences of, of diseases like SIDS, but also the study of these data sets uh, ends up leading to unexpected and serendipitous new knowledge uh, that advances our understanding of human biology and ultimately with medical research and healthcare. So I hope by now, uh, if you weren't convinced, I'd be shocked if actually if anyone uh, wasn't thinking this way. Um, there is just such possibility for computing in healthcare, and that possibility today uh, is really latent in data, in the data around us. And so now uh, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about that data. And so if we uh, look at the state of the world today in data, uh, one of the things that is really great is that we have managed to digitize, the world has managed to digitize a huge segment of really highly relevant health data. Just 15 years ago, less than 15% of Americans' health records were in digital form. And so some of you might remember 15 years ago, it was likely that your health records were in paper, stored in a file folder, stored in a storeroom. Now today, uh, now over 95% of Americans' health records are in digital form. Uh, and due to kind of a regulatory push, in fact, uh, in something called meaningful use regulations, 98% uh, of hospitals today make meaningful use of that digital data uh, by the kind of legal definition of the word uh, uh, meaningful use. That digital data is a foundation for giving us technologies that allow us to understand the patient better and get that understanding to the right place at the right time. It is a foundation for tools that allow people on the front lines of healthcare delivery to be more productive and to be more satisfied in their day-to-day -day working lives. Uh, and uh, that data is the foundation for this wonderful future of precisely targeted diagnostics and therapeutic technologies, or precision medicine. And so these three things, I think, are incredibly exciting and important possibilities. And they all start from data, which means they all start from us, the people in our community in this room. And so the, um, uh, so we're in this situation, all should be good, you would think. Um, but of course, uh, if any of you in this room have actually tried to do things at scale, at, you know, achieve impact at scale in healthcare uh, using data, you've probably run into uh, some problems. I'm reminded of this uh, old poem, um, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, you know, where uh, there's a point in this long poem where this ship is just drifting in the middle of a sea with no wind. Uh, and uh, the people on the ship, the crew, they're all lamenting that there's water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. And sometimes it feels this way when you're trying to do things in the real world uh, in healthcare. And in fact, uh, I've referred to this as something called the health data funnel. And so the health data funnel uh, goes like this. Um, where we sit within Microsoft, uh, we have no shortage of opportunities to do some cool things, to seize on some interesting and important opportunities to convert data into better health. Uh, in fact, at Microsoft, we have uh, uh, something like 170,000 commercial relationships with healthcare organizations in over 140 countries around the world. 
a large number of those are only too willing to work with us and our academic collaborators on some important problems in healthcare. Let's see if I can get my uh, picture of my um, funnel here. Great. So turning those opportunities, those ideas, into actual health data turns out to be really hard. There are legal and regulatory issues. There are privacy concerns and risks. Uh, there are actual legal barriers uh, that get in the way. And so the number of those opportunities that turn into health data uh, ends up being a small fraction of the number of opportunities we've run into. And then the actual number of those opportunities that turn into health data that actually turn into opportunities that can be legally exposed to our best tools, our best data mining machine learning tools, is smaller yet. Uh, I referred before to the fact that many of our tools have finally achieved the regulatory compliance, such as HIPAA and high trust, in order to be legally applicable to protected health information. But the vast majority of the tools in our, in our research community today in computer science uh, still aren't there yet. And so this reduces even further the number of these opportunities that we can act on. Uh, and then there's a further problem going one step beyond this, which is the number of these opportunities then that can be legally exposed to researchers and scientists and engineers that aren't directly connected to or employed in some legal way through a mechanism called a BAA uh, to actually look at and handle protected health information. And these restrictions are all there for good reason because Few things are more private and a few things need to be guarded more carefully than your own health information. Um, but the main problem with this is we get this funneling effect where by the time we actually get to the point where one of these opportunities, one of these hundreds or thousands of opportunities turns into health data in the hands of innovators that then finally gets injected into the operations of a hospital or health system or insurance company or a platform company in the health uh, sector, we end up with a long time to wait, sometimes years, and, and a funneling effect where we're left with just a handful of opportunities. And this has been a huge barrier to progress in this space. And so I'd like to spend the rest of uh, this uh, keynote just to talk through a little bit about what we as a research community can and should be doing to address this issue. And of course, it isn't us alone that can overcome this problem. Uh, this is a, a problem that involves uh, governments, it involves the healthcare industry, it, uh, it, it directly addresses business models and the economics of healthcare and healthcare delivery. Uh, but we definitely have uh, our own role to play. And so uh, th one of the important things that has been emerging uh, are new, modern, and open standards for health data. And so this really opens up the question, you know, what if we could speak the same language? Uh, if you've attempted to do things at scale in healthcare, um, it is actually quite dizzying the array of different types of data silos that are out there, each with its own protocols, each with its own data formats. And largely speaking, those data formats, from the perspective of what we do as a community research community, really ensconced in modern, say, web standards and so on, what we see in healthcare ends up being uh, pretty ancient, non-extensible, and certainly not able to keep up with the rapid advances in medical technology and medical research. And so what if we could bring these things together and have modern data standards uh, for health data? And what is exciting here is that this actually has uh, started to happen. Uh, one of the most exciting developments today is a new data standard uh, called Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, or FHIR. Uh, FHIR represents a new set of modern data models 
uh, for healthcare data. It's extensible. Uh, it has an API specification for exchanging those data models between organizations and doing so in a legal and compliant way. Uh, and uh, involves a set of tools and servers for building applications and interacting with those APIs. For us at Microsoft, this has been very important. And it's not just us, but it's also for other tech companies, uh, our colleagues uh, and competitors at places like Google and Amazon, IBM, and others. We've all been advancing together to embrace these new emerging standards. Uh, and we've been joined in this embrace uh, by the US government. And so last year, uh, I joined on stage with my counterparts at Google, Amazon, IBM, Salesforce, and Oracle uh, at the White House in order to publicly commit to integrating these new standards in an open way in our clouds and doing what we can to adopt technologies that advance the cause of health data interoperability. Uh, and just last month in July, one year later, uh, we returned to the White House in both private meetings and public meetings of the White House uh, in order to jointly report on the progress that we've been making. The government has been doing its own push on this uh, to really reinforce uh, and support uh, what the tech industry has been doing. And in fact, Health and Human Services, uh, through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the Office of the National Coordinator for Health, that's CMS and ONC, last February proposed new rules that essentially mandate the use of FHIR for health data and a specific API framework called SMART for application development and the interchange of that data. And furthermore, these rules uh, mandate that every patient, every consumer in the US should have free access, either directly through FHIR smart-based APIs uh, or through third-party applications that are built on those APIs uh, to their own data. And so this is a massive shift. And while it's sort of at the infrastructure level, they really represent arguably the biggest changes in healthcare policy in the United States uh, since uh, the Affordable Care Act. Very important. And so what is incredibly important for all of us as a computing research community is to embrace fire and understand it. Do our part to advance the cause of modern interoperable data standards in healthcare uh, and to direct our own healthcare research activities uh, and oriented around fire. It will become law uh, anyway in the, in the next few months uh, and coming years. For Microsoft, just to speak specifically about us, uh, but I want to emphasize again, this is not just Microsoft, but the other clouds are also advancing, uh, as well as other tech companies. Um, we have adopted the approach of integrating Fire as a first-class data type in our cloud Azure, as well as other standard healthcare data types, such as HL7, DICOM, BAM, and others. And so, uh, you might hear Microsoft in its marketing message talk about a health data platform, but in fact there isn't a health data platform. It is that Microsoft's cloud is speaking the language of healthcare natively. And so uh, while it might be easy, easier for us to talk about it as a platform, it is just our cloud. Our cloud is becoming a health cloud as we speak. This is something that um, is, uh, I think, very important, and we furthermore have taken the approach of embracing openness. And so while we are offering a managed platform as a service for our FHIR uh, and other standard health data formats, uh, we also uh, have published uh, our, all of our server code uh, openly on GitHub, and we've really appreciated uh, an open source community contributing and helping us advance and evolve our, our system. Um, and so one of the things that I would like uh, uh, to invite people in this room to do is to start experimenting, uh, either with our Fire Server for Azure, uh, which you can get on GitHub, uh, or 
uh, for uh, any other uh, applications uh, that you might want to build uh, on other clouds. Uh, we all have our own differentiated approaches to this, um, but they all really amount to advancing health data interoperability. Uh, and in the future, what I would like to see out of the machine learning and data mining communities uh, is more research being directed to uh, health data and, and that health data uh, being in an open format uh, like FHIR. Um, I uh, was prepared here to give you a demo, uh, which I think I'll skip in the interest of time. Uh, and anyway, uh, demoing a data format is probably one of the most gruesomely boring things you could possibly think about doing. Um, but um, if you go uh, on, uh, to GitHub, um, download, there is a whole page of uh, sample uh, codes there. Uh, you can start, uh, you can deploy your own fire service in minutes, um, and then uh, uh, integrate or ingest a bundle of health data uh, that we used uh, the service Cynthia uh, for generating synthetic uh, health data records. Uh, that you can go ahead and adjust and start playing with and build your own applications. And we have several smart-based applications uh, uh, also on, on, on GitHub that you can use. We've seen tremendous uh, kind of growth just in the last uh, six months uh, in the use of Fire. Uh, and we've been orienting our data mining and machine learning tools uh, around the ability to ingest Fire, as well as data visualization tools uh, such as Power BI um, and, and Dynamics. So, um, so please uh, look into FHIR. So now, um, if you think about uh, doing this, um, of course, this is important for our own business. And one of the things that is just incredibly interesting to us is that we are starting to see more and more use by our own partners and customers, organizations that are really working in delivering lower cost, more convenient, better healthcare for people, uh, embracing these data standards. And so this is uh, uh, an architecture diagram, and um, the details don't matter too much. Uh, but in our collaboration, for example, with, the, with Walgreens, uh, it's been exciting to us to see Walgreens integrating fire with retail and pharmacy data in a way that allows an aggregation uh, to open up new possibilities for machine learning and data science, for example, to address medication adherence, uh, which is still uh, you know, uh, uh, such a difficult and sticky problem and still such a huge uh, source of uh, lowered health outcomes for people. And so uh, we're starting to really see an exciting new era here and the fact that Fire can be a first-class data type in the cloud um, enables it to be integrated, for example, uh, with retail data and other kinds of data uh, that, that a, a company like Walgreens would deal with. So it's not just for hospitals and health systems. Uh, it, it can be for uh, interesting companies uh, like this as well. So now um, I, I'd like to finally, uh, so please use Fire. Please learn about it. Experiment with it. Uh, if you are working in healthcare, uh, think about uh, directing uh, your work towards the uh, advancement of fire. The things that this community does to advance fire can have a follow on effect that helps the whole world uh, advance on fire. And over the next, say, three years, I think we can really see a sea change where finally we have a universal, highly modern, and extensible data standard uh, for liberating and liquefying. Uh, health data more broadly. So now I'd, I'd like to finally uh, say a few words um, about uh, ethical considerations in all of this. Um, because one of the things that we didn't necessarily think too much about when we embarked on our healthcare journey uh, it, it pertains to the ethical, legal, and societal implications of deep analytics uh, on health data, on protecting health information. Uh, because these things really affect people in a very direct way. There are several high-level issues that uh, I would uh, say are important that we think about and have been learnings. Uh, one has to do with patient safety. I, and here, 
uh, I would say that we at Microsoft were guilty of this, but I see this also widespread in our computing research community. Um, I think here, uh, Eric Topol, um, in, in his recent book uh, and in some of his tweets, uh, his recent book, Deep Medicine, uh, asked the question, uh, how good is AI for predictive analytics in medicine? And he, so he embarked on a study of some high-profile uh, research advances that were published uh, in, our, uh, in our venues, uh, and he did sort of a deep dive. And in this sample of 12 papers, uh, he makes the point um, that all of these are all based uh, solely on retrospective studies. And that's not surprising. If you think about the way that we work, uh, you, you get a large amount of data. Sometimes we engage in cleaning that data, and then we try to train or extract a model from that data and then apply it. Uh, that does not bear any resemblance to the types of prospective validation studies that have been the linchpin of clinical validation for new medical technologies. Uh, and in fact, uh, in this situation, uh, what we find is that the advertised or claimed effectiveness or accuracy, for example, for a classifier, based on these retrospective studies, tends not to hold up very well when used in real clinical settings. Uh, and there are lots of reasons for this, but the main point is that there's a methodological issue here in the ways that we work and the ways that we do our research versus the ways that things are used in clinical settings. Uh, and this is something that we must address, and, uh, and uh, it, importantly, it starts with just being more humble in what we claim. It is probably not productive for us as a research community to be making claims, for example, that we have a computer vision system that outperforms human radiologists, unless we engage in those prospective validation studies. Because what we find again and again, and what Eric Topol's research shows us, is that our models and applications that are trained purely retrospectively tend not to hold up. In fact, universally don't hold up. Uh, when put through those, uh, those prospective uh, studies. So uh, it, it deserves caution, and we as a community uh, can, can be more cautious about this. There is a perfect storm because people in the healthcare community look at all of us working in data mining, knowledge discovery, machine learning, AI, and they view us as magicians that are able to just solve amazing problems, and there's tremendous optimism and faith in what we do. And of course, we sometimes look at what goes on in medicine and see them as, say, fairly simple and direct computer vision problems without understanding the rigorous necessity and the real world problems of data when you are actually in a clinical setting. And so that over-optimism from both directions can lead to real issues in patient safety. And I don't want to call out specific organizations right now, but we have already suffered uh, some serious uh, problems that have endangered patients' lives uh, through that over-optimism. Another, uh, uh, and this, of course, has really led uh, some people, uh, and uh, our good friend and colleague, Oren Etzioni, uh, actually um, wrote recently about the need for Hippocratic Oath uh, for AI practitioners. And I think it might be a good idea for all of us to take this more seriously. Uh, another issue uh, is uh, about health access. Uh, one thing that data is telling us today in most population studies, uh, and one of the ones that's really the most impressive is led by a colleague of ours that has joined Microsoft recently, Jim Weinstein, some, in something called the Dartmouth Atlas. Uh, and the Dartmouth Atlas, uh, if you're a data geek, is really uh, definitely worth looking into. Um, and it, it exposes tremendous and growing inequities. Uh, for example, in life expectancy, uh, dependent, that are highly dependent, for example, on uh, socioeconomic standing. 
Uh, and when you start to zoom in and look at this geographically, uh, and this is true in India, it's true in China, in Europe, uh, but if we zoom in, uh, for example, on the U.S. and, and look, for example, around New Orleans, and this is, uh, these are snapshots right out of the Dartmouth Atlas uh, and Jim Weinstein's work, um, you start to see this idea that, as Jim Weinstein puts it, that zip code is destiny when it comes to your health care. Uh, that life expectancy, for example, as well as costs, uh, the frequencies of, say, hip fractures, uh, inc uh, frequency of incidences of uh, diabetes and so on, can vary remarkably from zip code to zip code. That geography matters. And there is no doubt that advancing further the kind of data analytics that is kind of latent in things like the Dartmouth Atlas can give us more insights and can give us the tools we need and insights we need to uh, have uh, better access and better equality in healthcare. When you look at the Dartmouth Atlas, it's just a great thing, great data geeky thing to look at, um, but for this community, you'll also see that the sophistication of the data analytics is very low. It's, it's something that is just basically very simple statistics. Um, and the uh, amount of model extraction that we would be able to come to, uh, and the, also the possibility of predictive analytics, uh, uh, I think would be tremendous, something that I think would be great for our community to get involved in. And then uh, there are uh, issues around uh, ethics. Um, and, you know, I touched on the significant regulatory requirements uh, around patient privacy uh, and around uh, the protection of uh, health information. Uh, this is something that for Microsoft has ended up being very important in other realms, like uh, facial recognition. I'll say a little bit more about why we came to this uh, conclusion to ask governments for help on regulations, but these end up being very important. HIPAA and high trust actually end up being helpful to us because they provide a clear definition uh, of, of standards for privacy. And then there is the problem of diversity. So much of what we train our data sets on uh, is really trained on very unique kinds of audiences. The kinds of unique audiences that can afford to or gain access to a premier top tier place like a Mayo Clinic. And, uh, and oftentimes have significant gender and racial biases laden in the data. And so again, all of these things are data issues that uh, require a level of sophistication that would be present in, in our uh, community. So uh, at Microsoft, one of the things that we have done to try to address this is uh, have, uh, we've created a governance process. Uh, and this is in an organization within Microsoft called Ether. And I have a slide on this. Uh, Ether uh, has uh, is a body uh, panel of, of people within Microsoft uh, that really has tried to address a range of AI issues, but most importantly, it's a governance process so that when questions are raised, for example, questions about data privacy or about facial recognition, there's a governance process that tries to have a research-informed analysis to arrive at decisions, as well as simply stated policies. And when we fail to do this in Ether, uh, there's an escalation path in order to reach outside of Microsoft to other companies, to universities, uh, and even to governments to ask for help, for example, uh, by contemplating new regulations. And so while it's a process involving people, and therefore it can be a uh, uh, a faulty process. It has been uh, one that's been very important. And as we've embarked on the journey in healthcare and we're ingesting and analyzing more and more protected health information, um, this committee has become very important to everything that we do uh, in healthcare. And so it's been very important for us uh, to, to think hard about uh, all of the issues that you see uh, listed below. And what you see listed below are actually the separate working groups uh, under the Ether Committee. Uh, within Microsoft. All right, so uh, I would like to conclude and um, 
Uh, and uh, I have one more short video uh, from uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, he spoke uh, last year at our developer conference, and I thought that his, his short speech, uh, which is recorded here in video, um, would be just perfect here. But I wanted to just uh, conclude before I show the video by uh, saying that there's just tremendous possibilities for us. And the level of sophistication that this community can bring to healthcare problems is something that we actually don't have today in healthcare. And we can go beyond research and make these things real in actual healthcare delivery by really understanding the regulatory and compliance needs, but also by joining with the healthcare community and joining with governments around the world, and especially the US government, in advancing these new open standards uh, and doing what we can to promote their use to test their adaptability and extensibility uh, and, and to really embrace the, the, the openness um, uh, that's possible there. And if we do that uh, as a research and developer community, I think uh, within a short number of years, we can really change, uh, change the world for the better. So let me uh, play the video. Technology has a tremendous impact on each of us on our desire for discovery. It needs theoretical evidence. It frees up people to think and to create. And it brings people together to solve big problems. Computational power is growing and quantum computing is quickly being realized. Big data is providing new insights with 90% of the world's data being generated in the last two years. What is our role as developers, technology leaders and scientists? at this pivotal time. We must engage in a public dialogue, particularly about the responsibilities of big data and artificial intelligence. I am pleased that Microsoft is actively engaging in these discussions to incorporate all points of view when addressing issues such as privacy, employment, equality, and humanity. Open platforms accelerate innovation. I was adamant that we open sourced my ACAT speech system so developers could contribute and improve the project, thereby helping more people. Developers must continue building in the open, contributing code, and engaging in communities. We can achieve our greatest dreams when technology is an amplifier of, not a replacement to, the great things that people create. Developers today are helping to build this future. As a physicist, I believe I share many of the same traits as developers. We are all writers, we are all dreamers. Let us continue this journey together. And so finally, let me uh, just uh, acknowledge uh, that there, uh, of course, the work that I've shown you today um, I tried to name names, but in fact, it's a large army of people. Um, and um, there were a few that I've listed here on this slide that are um, that contributed directly to the slides I showed you today. Um, but at Microsoft, as well as at dozens of universities and other companies around the world, uh, there's been a tremendous uh, amount of contribution here. Uh, we really look at this as a collaborative uh, effort. Um, and. Um, and business-wise, it makes sense for us, too, because we really see the future of healthcare uh, really founded on data, uh, and data is, is what we really do at, at, at our company. So with that, um, thank you so much for your attention, and um, I'm uh, very happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you. Let me know if there are questions. Ten more seconds, and then we're going to call it quits. <laughs> uh -huh. There's one coming. <clears throat> Um, I'm not sure if I missed it. Um, you talked about fire. And yes, hi. 
Um, you talked about fire and I heard about fire a lot. And my question is about other countries and how fire is going there. Uh, are the people using it? Are they adopting it? Yeah, so great question. And um, fire is truly an international standard. Um, some of the key uh, players have been people like Graham Greve in Australia, um, uh, you know, others in Europe. And in fact, the Fire Dev Days conference uh, runs every six months. A great conference to go to. It's one of those things that um, just has a great vibe to it, great developer vibe. Uh, I mean, it's held um, once, uh, uh, it, it's held on a different continent each six months. So um, the most recent one was held in, uh, uh, in Amsterdam, and just before that, uh, we hosted it in Redmond. Uh, before that, it, uh, I think it was somewhere else in Europe. And so it's really viewed as a, an international open standard. The, um, but I would say that it's the U.S. government uh, and today's White House that has been making the most assertive push to require uh, healthcare organizations to adopt FIRE. And so uh, I think that is very good because whatever U.S. healthcare technology companies do, generally speaking, the rest of the world starts to adopt. And so, so that's, that's the current situation. So truly a global standard. Hey, Peter, this is Eric Iskiago. Yeah, I'm actually one of those down in the trenches guys. I'm a vascular neurosurgeon, a chief medical officer, and an executive vice president, so I wear multiple hats. And this conference has been amazing. I'm also a former aerospace engineer, so I believe in the data part of it. Uh, my question to you is, when companies like Microsoft, Apple, or Google, they always tend to gravitate towards these sexy institutions, uh, Johns Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, uh, you know, all those bigger institutions, Harvard, and, you know, institutions like mine, we have a $5 billion organization, 14 hospitals, and we see more of the regular patients that you want to see, the mosaic of patients, not just a specific type of zebras that bigger institutions see. And I feel like there's a big neglect on that side from the technology companies because we have a hard time teaming up. You know, we've tried to team up with Microsoft for Empower. Uh, we were not you know, given the opportunity, we're trying to do that same. We have more uh, cancer researchers in our institution than University of Virginia, yet we were not, you know, we can't team up to do uh, the research bot. And it's a little bit of a problem for us. The other question I have is, you know, I see a lot of social determinants being really a big predictor of healthcare. But unfortunately, they're all locked up in Facebook and, you know, Apple and Google. And because of Cambridge Analytica, now there's a big concern. We can't, you know, get to them. So I just wanted to hear your views on both of them. Yeah. So first of all, I, I really appreciate the, um, the feedback on the first point. And, and I think it is actually a real problem. And I think from the perspective of a company like Microsoft, and this is probably true also at uh, the other tech companies that you mentioned, uh, there's an initial desire just to become relevant and known that we're doing things. And so uh, we, are, we attach ourselves to the big names uh, just, just like anyone else. But I think you're absolutely right. As we've gotten deeper in this, we have seen, for example, uh, amazing need and opportunities uh, in this sort of broader ecosystem. So for example, in the work that we're doing with Centene, you know, Centene covers the healthcare costs for over half of uh, births in the United States. Uh, and that's through Medicaid. And so that in itself is a social statement along the lines of what you've expressed. And it does cause us to take a step back and think, who is it that we should be working with, particularly around the mission to really provide better and more equal access to healthcare to underserved communities? Uh, similarly, that has brought us into uh, discussions with interesting organizations, still name organizations like Trinity Health or Intermountain and so on, uh, where it, we are trying to learn about uh, those kind of community uh, uh, integration issues. So I think it's something that uh, we still need to do more and better. Um, and um, as we were talking earlier, uh, it would be great for us to, to do that also together. Um, on social determinants, um, so uh, one of the things that is happening is that we're seeing the rise of um, managed care, value-based care. And even the very big players like United Health or Humana and others uh, are seeing the fastest growth 
uh, in their uh, Medicare populations, uh, specifically the Medicare Advantage or sometimes in Centene's case, uh, managed Medicaid uh, populations. And what people have learned is that for properly managing uh, people in a value-based care setting, social determinants data has outsized importance. Uh, food security, social isolation, access to transportation, and other issues. And so one of the good things that's happened is that we've been impressed with the extent to which there are direct care managers engaging in hundreds of thousands of phone conversations and home visits uh, to people in those populations. And so now the question is, can we equip that operation with data to pull out the signal on social determinants data, relevant social determinants data. It's a, if you think about what we're doing with Empire MD, it's a very exciting prospect uh, to do that. Um, and so even without going into the sticky place of mining uh, social media feeds, uh, I think a lot can be done and there's tremendous motivation uh, as the world shifts to more value-based care settings. Right. Um, but, but yeah, I hear you. <laughs> uh, Lang Lee from Ohio State University. I'm working in academia as an informatician. Um, sometimes we, we are uh, we using the uh, EMR data from Cerner and App quite often in the academia setting. I just wondering from my, uh, uh, Microsoft's standpoint of view, what is the strategy of uh, collaborating with the EMR system uh, to further promote your product? Yes. So thanks. Um, and. Uh, I, I was, this was the one question I was expecting to get because I think uh, for people who have worked uh, with healthcare data, um, sometimes the electronic health record system and the big ones are ones like uh, Epic and Cerner, Allscripts and others, uh, sometimes can be a source of um, confusion and frustration. In fact, it's fashionable sometimes to cast a lot of blame for a lot of data problems today uh, on those systems. Uh, I actually hold the view that uh, that uh, the EHR systems have done a tremendous service in moving uh, health data into digital form. And of course, it's happened very quickly, um, so uh, we have issues and things that we need to improve, uh, but that's been a tremendous, uh, a tremendous advance. Uh, Epic, with Epic, uh, we work very closely with Epic. Um, uh, that, much of that work is focused on their cognitive computing platform. And so if you're familiar with Epic uh, and you use some of the ECCP features, those things, generally speaking, run on our cloud and have uh, co-development uh, with uh, machine learning and data scientists at, at Microsoft. Um, and uh, similarly with all scripts, uh, we work very closely uh, with all scripts. Today, as we engage with Cerner, uh, particularly outside of the US, uh, we have a collaboration with Cerner outside of the US, uh, with Epic, with all scripts, and many others. Um, it is much uh, to do about data formats and data interoperability and really trying to uh, help uh, these companies uh, transition to these new data standards. And uh, we view that as really important work and mutually beneficial work. Thanks. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, has Microsoft considered doing healthcare research into ME, the causes of ME, CFS, or chronic fatigue syndrome? given that over 17 million people suffer from the disease and the cause is still unknown. Uh, and I missed the disease, can you uh, that? Chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh, yes. Best. Yes, so um, actually this goes back to my very first example. Um, one of the things that, uh, it, it's a little bit of, uh, of a early hope right now, um, but as you know, there are um, tremendous mysteries about various forms of autoimmune-related disorders. And, um, and, and so we've been very focused right now in, in our work um, being you know, led by Jonathan Carlson and Ryan Emerson um, on celiac uh, disease. And the reason for that is that uh, we can actually get uh, samples, uh, antigen libraries from leading research institutions uh, in, in order to run through the MIRA assays and, and start to build the models. Um, but hidden in those TCR repertoire samples uh, is evidence that if we could just decode it, might say a lot about other autoimmune-related uh, issues going on. Um, and so uh, this is something that is of extreme interest to us. 
And so what our hope is that as we address more and more disease targets, that we start to discern structure in these models that might at a minimum give early signals about some specific uh, autoimmune-related uh, issue. Uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, is that uh, adaptive biotechnologies um, last January uh, signed a deal with Genentech uh, to do something vaguely related, at least from the machine learning perspective, uh, which is to look at the TCR repertoire structure in, in order to provide better targeting of cellular therapies, in that case for uh, probably for cancer in the case of Genentech. Um, but it, it's that sort of analytics that might also give evidence for specific treatments for autoimmune-related disorders. So it, it is all highly speculative uh, right now, and we're very, very focused on, on uh, simpler and narrower disease targets. But it, it's one of the things, as we learn more about the human body's natural machine learning system, uh, which is your auto, uh, which is your immune system, um, uh, in the same way that we want to be able to explain our AI, uh, explain our convolutional neural networks, uh, explaining uh, you know what's going on with uh, with the natural machine learning of your T cells uh, is, is, I think, a tremendous opportunity for the future. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I think you touched this briefly. So when you build a knowledge graph from the 4,000 papers that publish daily from PubMed, what type of effort is taken to like different credibilities from different publications and maybe most studies cannot be replicated by other people? So like, yeah. Yeah, uh, so thanks for that. Um, in the, uh, the main pilot that we, we've been running, um, there's a there's a kind of a search interface that's a, that, you know, where you can uh, search for these associations. Then they're extracted and presented um, in, in, uh, out of the knowledge graph. Um, uh, out of that, uh, certainly uh, you're likely to see uh, over time some contradictions. And of course, um, there could be, in the case of PubMed, there could be mistakes or even uh, incorrect information in these things. And so ultimately, you're still dependent on a tumor board um, to go and read the papers and study them for yourself. You don't just accept the, you know, the extractions from the knowledge graph. Um, but you know, the, the amount of um, productivity gain is tremendous. There are several orders of magnitude because basically the tool gives you a way to zoom in and link directly to the relevant papers. Uh, so that as a tumor board, um, you know, you can just focus on the one or two or ten specific papers that are relevant uh, to the specific uh, cancer that you're, that you're trying to treat. So um, there is a very, very interesting work on Semantic Scholar, as many of you know, at uh, the Allen Institute for AI. Um, and, and there, you know, there are, I think, broader and more ambitious uh, possibilities uh, to really understand and assess the, the quality of the information uh, in, in papers. Um, uh, at our juncture right now, we're really just trying to provide the raw decision support in what we're doing. So one more question. Uh -huh. Hi there. Thanks for your talk earlier. Um, so I grew up in Singapore where diabetes and kidney failure was a, in fact a big part of the population. And I don't think um, like ML or having the data has, I don't think we've really invested in that um, that that form of disease yet. I was just curious as a, thinking about as an ML community, are there fundamental problems in healthcare that you think we're currently under indexing? Either we don't have enough data or we have the data, but just as an ML community, we just haven't invested in. Just kind of curious about your thoughts. Yeah, this is a great question. And um, I, I, I have a, a bad joke that I always tell in these situations, which is, uh, when you figure this out, please tell me. And I, um, so, I, um, uh, so uh, about 80% of healthcare costs are expended uh, in the management uh, and treatment of chronic diseases. Uh, and they're the five major chronic diseases of which diabetes. Uh, is one. Sometimes people add a sixth because cancer uh, treatment has been advancing rapidly enough where it is oftentimes uh, very, acts very much like a chronic condition. 
Um, and so uh, addressing issues uh, in those chronic conditions, uh, at least economically and in terms of overall human uh, impact and human health, uh, would have the, the biggest uh, impact. So these are things, you know, um, in heart disease, in uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, stroke, and so on. Um, and so that's sort of a simple answer. Um, the second thing that we, and, and so much of what we do uh, does end up trying to focus on those things. So for example, uh, we have a project called Aurora uh, that Scott Saponis and team have been working on, which uh, is a sensing device that allows you to get insights uh, into hypertension and provide more tools for managing hypertension. Um, those sorts of things uh, have outsized potential for impact. The other thing that we think about is access. Uh, today, about 4 billion people uh, on the planet don't have reasonable access to, to uh, health care and health care services. Um, and so uh, another thing that we think about is the ways in which technology might be able to extend the reach uh, of good health care services so that more of those 4 billion people uh, might be able to benefit. And there, for example, we have pilot deployments in India uh, that have embedded simple computer vision models into eye image cameras, not to diagnose or replace uh, an ophthalmologist, but to just tell an inexpert operator of the camera, did you take a good picture or not, before you send it off uh, to a clinic. And so tools like that really help to serve more underserved populations. And so I guess my simple answer it would be chronic conditions uh, and access. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Great questions. Thanks. <laughs>